song through the trees as the stirring of the priest. So it is with the Spirit of God as the heart is strangely warm, as the voice within the storm. So it is with the Spirit of God. Never say.
O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Day spring is a sunrise. At Presbyterian Caseman Hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the rising and the setting of the sun brings a riot of colors to the desert. Blue shadows on distant horizons, watermelon flashes on mesa tops, a thousand shades of green in the foliage. Scripture says that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And even if we humans can't find it in ourselves to rejoice, the very rocks of creation will cry out. As if the coming risings and settings bring us closer to the birth of Jesus, let us find joy in the anticipation. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. Regocijémonos, regocijémonos, regocijémonos. A voice cries out in the wilderness, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. As we confess together before God and the gathered community of faith, let us sing.
good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain the everlasting all. Christ was born to save. Christ was born. Will you pray with me? Holy God, our hope and strength, by the power of your Spirit, prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word, so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. And when the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. El pasaje del Evangelio se encuentra hoy en San Lucas, capítulo 1. Versos 26 al 38, y lee así. A los seis meses, Dios mandó al ángel Gabriel a un pueblo de Galilea llamado Nazaret, donde vivía una joven llamada María. Era virgen, pero estaba comprometida para casarse con un hombre llamado José, descendiente del rey David. El ángel entró en el lugar donde ella estaba y le dijo, Salve llena de gracia. El Señor está contigo. María se sorprendió de estas palabras. Se preguntaba qué significaría aquel saludo. El ángel le dijo, María, no tengas miedo, pues tú gozas del favor de Dios. Ahora vas a quedar encinta. Tendrás un hijo y le pondrás por nombre Jesús. Será un gran hombre al que llamarán Hijo del Dios Altísimo. Y Dios, el Señor, lo hará rey, como a su antepasado David, para que reine por siempre sobre el pueblo de Jacob. Su reinado no tendrá fin. María preguntó al ángel, ¿Cómo podrá suceder esto si no vivo con ningún hombre? El ángel le contestó, el Espíritu Santo vendrá sobre ti, y el poder del Dios Altísimo se posará sobre ti. Por eso, el niño que va a nacer será llamado Santo e Hijo de Dios. También, tu parienta Isabel va a tener un hijo, a pesar de que es anciana. La que decían que no podría tener hijos. Está encinta desde hace seis meses. Para Dios no hay nada imposible. Entonces María dijo, 
Yo soy esclava del Señor. Que Dios haga conmigo como me has dicho. Con esto, el ángel se fue. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm sitting here in this stable we have in the sanctuary here at church. Some of you have, have seen this before. For years we bring this out and week by week during Advent, each week we put another piece of this stable together so that we can talk about and imagine the story of Jesus' birth. And, and as we do it, part of the fun is imagining ourselves in that story. So I like this. I like to sit in here and, and look up at look at it and imagine that that story. You probably don't have a, a stable in your house. Some of you might have a stable in your backyard, but I wonder how many of you have a, a nativity set. I like them a lot. I have actually a lot of them. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Figures of um, that tell the story of, of Jesus' birth. When I was growing up, we had a lot of them. My mom loved nativity sets. And I used to love to set them up and we'd set them and we'd move them around. And, and it was fun to imagine myself in those stories and in those sets. Um, I have a special set here that actually my mom made for me. It's made out of cloth. It's, there's a, a process called batik where you dye cloth. And, and, and she made this and um, gave it to me. And I love to, I love to set it up and to look at it because it's so much creativity and imagination in it. I say, I mean, there's, you can see there's, there's Mary. And I like, she's wearing blue and purple and somewhere in here. Oh, here. and here's Joseph. And I like that mom imagined that they both had halos. You can see around their head there. And he has arms spread out. So I like to put them next to each other where Joseph is, is, is hugging Mary. They're excited as I imagine it. And she made lots of other characters. Um, I like this guy. He's a, he's a shepherd. He has a beard and uh, he looks very dignified, but he also looks very proud. And then there's this shepherd. It's a woman. I love how she's made in, in pink, pink and, and she has a great big smile on her face. And uh, yeah, let me see what else we have here. Oh, there's another, there's another, maybe, no, I think just two shepherds. There are, there is a, some animals, they're kind of fun. You can't have shepherds without having a sheep. You can't have a, a stable without a donkey. And, and mom made a cow and the cow has blue eyes. Isn't that great? <laughs> and then of course, they're wise men who, who come or wise folks. I think the ones mom made all are, are men, although one of them could be, could be a woman. There's, there's this guy and he has his, his, uh, his beard. So I'm going to put him next to this guy with the beard there and they're kind of hugging. They're all excited. And here's one that uh, maybe it's a woman and has a chest here. And this person coming, so excited to see. And then there's this one. I like him because he has a blue beard and he's very tall, and very proud. And uh, have our three kings. And then, of course, I gotta push this in. They're kind of hard to stand up. They have little rocks in the bottom to help them, but sometimes they fall over. Um, then there's an angel. Look at that nice. Has wings and a halo and uh, all kinds of fancy stitching on it and stars. I imagine those are stars on there. And uh, an angel. And then, of course, the baby Jesus. <laughs> the baby Jesus. I had a dog that one time decided it wanted to chew on the baby Jesus' head. And so we had to repair it. And uh, so baby Jesus is uh, a little worse for wear, but that's okay. That's okay. So I like to set them up and to move them and play with them. You know, I hope... You know, maybe you have a nativity set and you can go and, and set it up. Maybe you already have. 
I also think it's fun to move them around and play with them and imagine different stories like how did they get here and how did they come and as you do it tell the story to yourself but more so find yourself in it and if you don't have one you can make one up I had a friend who's whose kids used to uh, put their Lego characters in their nativity set. It's all your imagination. But that's the gift of this time, is that as we hear the story of Jesus being born, we get to imagine ourselves in the story. So I hope you'll do that. Um, and let's have a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this, this season and the story that fills it, and how that story draws us in and even includes us. So Lord, help us to imagine. Imagine all the ways that your love changes us and the ways we can live into that love. In Jesus' name, amen. story. And I'm so grateful to Catherine Patterson for sharing a stubborn sweetness and other stories for the Christmas season. This is her account of the handmaid of the Lord. People think when your father is the minister that you get special favors, like you were God's pet or something. Rachel, for one, knew absolutely positively that it was not true. God didn't love her better than Jason McMillan, who was getting an entire set of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for Christmas. God didn't love her better than Carrie Wilson, who was getting a new Barbie dollhouse with two new dolls, outfits included. Not that Rachel really wanted a Barbie dollhouse or Power Rangers either for that matter, but it was the principle of the thing. Carrie and Jason were getting what they asked Santa Claus for. When Rachel asked Santa for a horse, John and Beth just rolled their eyes. John and Beth were her older brother and sister. Beth was 11 and John 13, and they thought that they knew everything. But where would we keep a horse, Rachel, her mother, had asked. She was changing baby David's diapers and not paying Rachel much attention. We live in the church manse. You know how small our yard is. Rachel, her father, had said in his most patient voice, What is Christmas really about? If all you think about is Santa Claus, you're going to miss the main event. Rachel's heart sank. When your father told you to think what Christmas was really about, she knew what that meant. It meant no horse, not even a pony. Minister's kids never got really good presents at Christmas. She should know that by now. It didn't count if you were naughty or nice. Gregory Austin 
had pulled the alarm last Sunday and made the fire trucks come in the middle of the church service, but he was still getting his own computer. His daddy had said so. Her daddy told everybody that they were supposed to be like God's servants, just like Jesus was, and he didn't even mention presents. So, no good presents. Rachel had given up on that, but a big role in the primary class's Christmas play, that shouldn't be too much to ask for. She was by far the best actress in the whole second grade. Plus, she went to Sunday school every single week, even when she had the sniffles or it snowed so hard that she and John and Beth were the only ones there. Don't you think a kid who comes every single Sunday, no matter if it's a blizzard, should get a good part in the primary class's play, she'd asked. We live next door to the church, stupid, John had said. You don't get brownie points for walking across your side yard. You're the minister's daughter, Rachel, Beth had said. It would look bad if you grabbed a big part. You got to be the angel Gabriel in both the second and third grade, Rachel reminded her. That was different, Beth said. I was the only one in either class who could remember all the lines. The head angel has a lot to say. Besides, I speak out. Everyone in the back row heard me perfectly. I can speak out, Rachel said, but no one paid any attention. When she was five, she had been part of the heavenly host. It was a terrible part. The angel costumes were made of a stiff, gauzy stuff that itched something awful. And afterward, Mrs. McLaughlin, who ran the pageant, yelled at her right in front of everybody. Rachel Thompson, angels are spiritual beings. They do not scratch themselves while they sing. You had the congregation laughing at the heavenly host and I was mortified. Last year, Mrs. McLaughlin had taken a rest from directing and Miss Westford had run the pageant. Miss Westford believed in equal opportunity. So for the first time in the history of First Presbyterian Church, girls had been shepherds and wise men. That was okay with the girls, but the boys were mad. They didn't like the itchy angel costumes at all, and a lot of the fathers complained. But Rachel had been a much better shepherd than those stupid boys. She didn't care what anyone had said afterwards. She knew what the Bible meant when it said the shepherds were sore afraid. When Mr. Nelson shined the spotlight at them to show that the angel of the Lord was about to come upon them, Rachel had shown everyone in the church what it meant to be sore afraid. Help! Help! she cried, loud enough to be heard by the people in the very back row. Don't let it get me! The congregation laughed. So did Gabriel and all the shepherds and the entire heavenly host. Mary laughed so hard that she started choking and Joseph had to whack her on the back. Her father said later that it had been a brand new insight on the Christmas story. And her mother said, never mind, dear, they weren't laughing at you. But she knew better. No one in the whole church understood what the story was really about. When the Bible said sore, afraid, you were supposed to be scared. When that big, lit hit, when that big light hit her face, Rachel had been trembly all over. She knew in her heart that she was the only kid in the pageant who felt that way. Not even the second or third graders who got all the big parts did them right. If you couldn't have a scratching angel, you sure couldn't have a Joseph yawning so wide that you could drive a tractor trailer straight down to his tonsils. It had been a hard year. Her mother had been tired and pregnant for most of it. And then when David was finally born, she gotten tired and busy. Beth thought David was the cutest thing in the world. Was I cute when I was little? Rachel asked her. I can't remember, Beth said. I know you cried a lot and your face got really red and she went back to goo-gooing at the baby. John wasn't as silly. He was always bragging about how great it was to have a little brother, finally. What's the matter with little sisters? Rachel asked. And John just rolled his eyes. Now at the end of the worst year of her entire life, Christmas wasn't going to be any better. Even the carols were against her. All those songs about the city of David. Couldn't we make up a Christmas song about the city of Rachel? She asked her mother. But her mother just smiled and kept on singing about David. 
Hey, John said one night, I just realized we're all in the Christmas story. David, Elizabeth, John. What about me, Rachel said. Oh, you're in it, John said. I am? Yeah, I can't remember the verse, but there's something off the side of the story about somebody named Rachel weeping and wailing. It's because King Herod killed all our children, Beth said. It just wasn't fair. Everyone else had a nice place in the story. Everyone but Rachel. And it made her more determined than ever to have a good part in the play. One in which she would not scratch or yell or wail. Mary. She would be Mary. She was old enough this year. She was the best actress in the second grade. Surely, even if she was the minister's daughter, Mrs. McLaughlin would pick her. She'd be so good in class that Mrs. McLaughlin would just see that nobody deserved to be Mary more than Rachel did. Besides, her little, little brother had already been chosen to be baby Jesus. She ought to be Mary. Jesus shouldn't have a stranger to be his mother. It might scare him. Now, said Mrs. McLaughlin at the first practice, it's a good thing we have a lot of kindergarten to third graders in this church because we have a lots of parts in this play. Mrs. McLaughlin, Rachel said. What is it, Rachel's? What is it, Rachel? Mrs. McLaughlin's voice sounded a tiny bit impatient, so Rachel talked fast. I know I'm the minister's kid and that when I was little, sometimes... Yes, Rachel? Well, I've studied the part really hard, and since my brother is the baby Jesus, I thought, well, it would probably mean a lot to him if, well, if his big sister could be Mary. But we don't have sixth graders in the play, Rachel. Elizabeth is too old. I don't mean Elizabeth, Mrs. McLaughlin. I mean, well, what's the matter with me? There was a burst of laughter in the room and everyone was laughing at her. Rachel's face went scarlet. Shut up, she yelled. I'm serious. I know the story better than anybody here and it's my brother. Everyone laughed harder. Even the little ones who were going to be itchy angels were giggling. Rachel, dear, said Mrs. McLaughlin after she finally got control of the group. Of course you know the Christmas story. After all, your father is our minister. But Mary is a very difficult role. I could do it, Rachel muttered. But she knew it was no use. People weren't supposed to laugh at Mary and everybody laughed at her when they paid her any attention at all. Carrie, Mrs. McLaughlin was saying, how would you like to be our Mary this year? Carrie Wilson? She had blue eyes and blonde curls all the way down her back and didn't look a thing like Mary. And that fake smile, it made Rachel so sick to her stomach. Carrie Wilson's Mary would look like a plastic wimp. Mary was the handmaid of the Lord, for heaven's sake, not some department store doll. Rachel could hardly listen as Mrs. McLaughlin went down the list, telling everyone what they were supposed to be. And she knew now that she wouldn't even get a speaking part. Mrs. McLaughlin didn't like her. Nobody liked her, not even God. And finally, Mrs. McLaughlin stopped. Rachel looked up. She hadn't heard her name. She didn't want to say anything because maybe her name had been called when she wasn't listening and then Mrs. McLaughlin would have something else to fuss about. But she couldn't stand it, so she raised her hand. Yes, Rachel, ab about my part. Yes, Rachel, this year you have a very important part. I do? Yes, you will be our understudy. Our what? Since you know the story so well, you will be prepared to substitute in case any of our actors become ill or unable to perform. Substitute? You mean I don't even have my own part? You have all the parts. In case, why suppose, for example, Gabriel should lose her voice, you would step in and be our Gabriel. Jennifer Rouse, the third grader who had been chosen to be Gabriel, gave Rachel a dirty look. She had no intention of losing her voice. Or if Mrs. McLaughlin smiled sadly at Carrie Wilson, our Mary were to suddenly have to visit her grandmother in Ohio, you would have to step in and be Mary. My grandmother's coming here for Christmas, Mrs. McLaughlin, Carrie said sweetly. Rachel wasn't stupid. 
She knew what Mrs. McLaughlin was doing. She wasn't keeping Rachel from having a big part. She was making sure that Rachel wouldn't have any part at all. So when she got home, she told her mother that she was never going back to Sunday school in her whole entire life. Nonsense, dear, her mother said. And of course she went back. Minister's children have to go to Sunday school. It's like the law or something. And then, then, a miracle happened. One week before Christmas, Carrie Wilson who wore the world's prissiest little blue leather boots, slipped on the ice in the mall parking lot and broke both her arms, both her arms. Rachel was overcome with exceeding great joy. God did love her. He did. One arm might count as an accident, but two arms were a miracle. God meant business. No matter how determined Mrs. McLaughlin was to keep her out of the play, God was going to make sure not only that she got in, but that she got the most important part in the whole shebang. She was going to be Mary, the handmaid of the Lord. Of course, she didn't tell anybody how joyful she was. She was too smart for that. When Mrs. McLaughlin called her on the phone, Rachel practically cried at the news that she would have to pinch hit for our poor little Carrie. I'll do my best, Mrs. McLaughlin, she said quietly and humbly just like the real Mary would have. She went early to the dress rehearsal so Mrs. McLaughlin could try the costume on her. It fit perfectly. Well, it would have fit practically anybody. Those robe things weren't exactly any size, but Rachel took it as a good sign when Mrs. McLaughlin sighed and admitted, yes, it did fit. Don't you worry, Mrs. McLaughlin, Rachel said. I'm the understudy. I know the part perfectly, which was a little silly since Mary didn't say a word, just looked lovingly into the manger while everyone else sang and carried on. But she wanted Mrs. McLaughlin to know that she wasn't going to do anything to make anybody laugh this year. She would be such a good Mary that Mrs. McLaughlin would be practically down on her knees, begging her to take the part again next year. They'd probably have to extend the play past third grade so they could keep Rachel in the role of Mary until she was grown up and through college and had babies of her own. We have to eat early, she told her mother on Christmas Eve. Mrs. McLaughlin wants the cast there an hour before the service. Thank goodness, said John. I don't think I could stand another hour of loud Gloria sung off key. But Rachel didn't care. She was so happy the Gloria's just kept bursting out from inside her. Besides, she had to get them all out before seven o'clock. She couldn't let a stray Gloria pass her lips when she was behind that manger. God might understand, but Mrs. McLaughlin surely wouldn't. She was all dressed in the sky blue robe, sitting quietly, looking down into the empty manger. Mrs. McLaughlin, hoarse from yelling at the heavenly host, was giving last minute directions to the wise men when suddenly the back door of the sanctuary opened. Why, Mrs. Wilson, Carrie, Mrs. McLaughlin said, and Rachel jerked up in alarm. It was Carrie, standing in the darkened sanctuary, her fake fur trim coat hanging off her shoulders, both arms bound to the front of her body. She insisted, Mrs. Wilson was saying, she said the show must go on. I talked to Dr. Franklin and he said it would be the best thing in the world for her. She was so distressed about letting everyone down that it was having a negative effect on her healing process. Two mothers yanked the beautiful blue robe off Rachel and draped it over Carrie's head. See, it was meant to be, Mrs. Wilson said. It totally hides the casts. Rachel slunk off the platform and slumped down in the first pew. No one seemed to notice. All the adults were ooing and aahing about how brave Carrie was to come and save the play. Oh yes, she's in terrible pain, her mother was saying, but she couldn't bear to disappoint you all. No one cared that Rachel was disappointed, not even God. Of course, God had known all along that Carrie would show up at the last minute and steal back the part. 
God knew everything and he had let Rachel sing and rejoice and think for a few days that he was on her side, that he had chosen her like Mary to be his handmaid. But it was just a big joke, a big mean joke. And she kicked the red carpet at her feet. Off stage, off stage, everyone. Time to line up in your places. Where did you go when there wasn't any place for you? Rachel looked around. People were beginning to arrive for the service. She slipped farther down in the pew. She didn't want her family to see her. They'd find out soon enough that God had fired her. She saw her mother carry David up the far aisle. The baby was sucking happily on his pacifier. He would be a good Jesus. Everybody would say so. Mrs. McLaughlin was waiting at the door to the hall. She took David and said something to mom who cocked her head in a doubtful manner. She was telling mom that Rachel wasn't going to be Mary after all. If she did, maybe mom would come on over and take her on her lap and tell her she was sorry, but no, mom didn't even look her way. The play went well. None of the angels cried or scratched. Gabriel knew all her lines and said them loud enough to be heard almost to the back row. The wise men remembered to carry in their gifts and nobody's crown rolled off the top of their head. Joseph did not yawn and Mary gazed sweetly into the manger. It was all perfect, perfect without her. And Rachel felt like weeping and wailing like the Rachel in the Bible. And then suddenly a miracle occurred. Baby Jesus began to cry not just cry, but scream, yell his little lungs out. Carrie Wilson forgot about being Mary and she turned absolutely white. Her eyes went huge, like she was about to panic. She would have probably got up and run, but with her arms bound under her robe, she couldn't move. She looked at Joseph, do something, she whispered, and Joseph's face went bright red, but he didn't even move a muscle. It was all up to Rachel. She jumped up from her pew and dashed up the chancel steps, and she was still panting when she got to the manger. Rachel poked around under the baby until she found the pacifier and jammed it into David's open mouth. He clamped down on it at once, and the big church went silent, except for his noisy sucking, and Rachel smiled down at him. He was a lovely Jesus. Who do you think you are? Carrie Wilson hissed through her teeth, but the whisper was almost loud enough to be heard in the back row, and Rachel could hear a snicker from somewhere out in the darkened sanctuary. Behold, Rachel straightened up and said sternly in the direction of the offender, there was no doubt that the people in the last pew could hear her, I am the handmaid of the Lord, and I say unto you, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men, women, and children. And nobody laughed. They didn't dare. Merry Christmas. Let us pray. God of all grace and mercy, in this season that has been filled with hoping, with longing, with preparing, we pray that you fill our hearts, that you open them up and ready them for the coming of your Christ child. We pray that in this season that looks nothing like we expect it to look, you find ways to bring us comfort and peace that we might know best how to respond as your people to a world that is so broken right now. We pray that in this holy season, even though it doesn't look the way that we think it should, we find ways to open ourselves up to the joy of these days. And here today, we are mindful of what this is truly all about. The love that is coming into the world, the love that is embodied in the Christ child, 
for whom we have been preparing all this time. So help us to live into that love. Help us to find ways to let that love permeate all that we are, that we might be ever more ready to respond as your people, to support one another, and to help each other through this time. We lift up our prayers for all those that we have named this morning in this chat. We lift up our prayers for all those who may be finding this season particularly difficult, feeling lonely, feeling cut off, feeling lost. And we pray, loving God, that when it's possible, help us be an answer to the prayers of others. For loving God, you have been an answer to our prayers in the coming of the Christ child, the same one who would go on to become our great teacher, the one who would teach us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, in this season, there are a great many people in need, and there are so many ways that we can respond. For one, you can give to the Presbytery's Family to Family Fund as we continue to try to support those who are hardest hit financially by the realities of COVID. We also encourage you, as always, to give to your local congregations. They are still doing important ministry, and those churches, our churches, could really use your help. Finally, as we are in this Christmas season, we have one of our denominational offerings through the Presbyterian Church USA. It is called the Christmas Joy Offering. By giving to the Christmas Joy Offering, you honor God's gift of Jesus Christ by providing assistance to current and retired church workers in their times of need and developing our future leaders at Presbyterian-related schools and colleges and equipping communities of color. So please give to the Christmas Joy Offering, and the best way for you to do that is to give to your local congregation and to designate that gift for Christmas Joy. Let us now bring to God our tithes and offerings. Goatsi se hopa, wa hename puraika, punikaya sou, shui hani o shachwashi. Hi everyone, my name is Kristen Riley and I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna. I have been at Manal for the last two years. Activities that I have enjoyed during my time here are Mission Week in Mexico, playing basketball, and managing for track. My capstone was on modern day metalsmithing with a concentration on traditional bracelets. But how has Manal school made me world smart? Coming to Manal, I was very shy and had a hard time talking to people. But coming to Manal, the atmosphere almost forces you to become more talkative, and I'm very grateful for that. Coming from a rural public school, it was challenging to say the least. I knew everyone at my old school, so it was a bit of an adjustment to get to know completely different people and realize that they're from different countries, which meant new cultures to learn about. I was excited, but I started freaking out. I had zero to no social skills, so I was a stuttering mess, but I managed to make new friends who later introduced me to their friends, and I started to get comfortable. Next thing I knew, I had become friends with one of the Vietnamese dorm students, and I started making friends with the other dorm students. My plans at this point are to pursue my communicative studies degree at New Mexico State University. And to the class of 2020, I wish you well in the goals that you wish to pursue, and hopefully we all meet again. And at this time, I would like to thank my family and friends for the love, support, and encouragement. I will also like to thank the Manal School family, the teachers, dorm students, cooks, and support staff for accepting me for who I am and preparing me for the next step in life. I encourage everyone watching this to continue to support Manal School community to maintain the welcoming atmosphere that I was lucky enough to arrive to. Thank you.
us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, your generous outpouring of grace in Jesus Christ fills our lives with love and purpose. You have come close to each of us. You have extended to us your own special love and have given to us such special gifts. Therefore, with our hearts full of gratitude and our eyes set on Christ, who emptied himself to be among us, we offer the fruit of our very lives to you. We ask you receive these gifts as outpouring of our desire to share in your coming reign among us. May our offerings be used to transform our world, the small world we inhabit with the suffering people we know, the larger world where the power of love is sorely needed, the world you love so much, even as we await the coming of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. As you go into this Christmas week, may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you will live deeply and from the heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people and the earth so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless you with tears to shed for all those who mourn so that you will reach your hand out to them and turn their mourning into joy. And may God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you will go about doing those things that others say cannot be done. And know that the love of God, the grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ, the communion and the power of the Holy Spirit, are with us and within us this holy day and forever. Amen.